The personal is political. Uh, it was said at the dawn of the feminist movement. Uh, so please allow me to begin the, uh, with a personal story about the origins of what I came to call freedom to love. I was a late bloomer in matters of love and didn't have a steady girlfriend until I was almost 20 years old. Um, we were very much in love. And one day, we were walking in the streets of Barcelona with her, I had this realization. Why does being in love with this wonderful woman mean that I cannot love or be loved by any other human being in the planet in romantic or intimate ways? When I shared my concerns with my friends and family members, the immediate response was that uh, I still haven't found my true love or soulmate, or that it, there must be something wrong with me. Um, and then, uh, of course, like uh, being so innocent in matters of love, I cannot believe them. I cannot believe them. Only much later, I could recognize that by doing so, I was falling prey to an internalized polyphobia that raises concerns such as, What's wrong with me if I want to love romantically more than one person at the same time? To avoid any confusion, I want to stress right away that my goal in this talk is not to promote polyamory, open relationships, or any other type of no consensual non-monogamy. My goal here is far more ambitious and perhaps more intriguing. My goal in this talk is to enhance our relational freedom beyond both monogamy and polyamory but I'm getting ahead of myself, so please bear with me a bit more and allow me to go on with my personal story. After two unsuccessful monogamous relationships, unsuccessful because I'm not proud to say I would end up cheating, and that was really painful for me and for others. After those attempts at relationships, I met a couple of amazing psychotherapists who had been happily together in an open relationship for many years. They both struck me as very rational, emotionally intelligent, spiritually deep. Meeting these two beautiful souls was a turning point for me because it helped me to realize that perhaps I wasn't crazy. Or perhaps, or at least, that I was not alone in my craziness, which is always comforting, <laughs> right? <laughs> Eventually, with uh, his partner full support, I entered into a romantic relationship with her. And I can say without hesitation that I experienced relational and spiritual possibilities I had never dreamt to be possible. Empowered by this experience and the more liberal atmosphere of the Bay Area of San Francisco, when I had arrived there in 1993 to pursue my doctoral degree, I came out as a poly man and lived open relationships for about a decade. But then, and here is where things start to get intriguing for me, after a decade of polyamory, I was first called to enter a three-year period of highly erotic, asexual, aromantic celibacy, and then to leave monogamous relationships for another 10 years. So the bottom line here is that at some point of my life, I couldn't identify myself as being monogamous or polyamorous. I felt that I could live both relational styles without serious fears or conflicts, and that therefore I was free to love one way or the other, depending on the cards that life threw at me. I felt liberated, but then there was another shocking realization. In our black or white world, there is no alternative. You are monogamous or polyamorous. Even though I have lived long periods of both monogamy and polyamory, some close friends still see me as a poly man. The message is here, it's clear. If you are not monogamous, you must be polyamorous and vice versa. And if you ever deviate from monocentrism, the cultural assumption that monogamy is the natural and only correct way to mate, the stigma sticks with you for life. But what if? What if we could go beyond that black or white vision and try novel lenses, not only to see, but to live our intimate relationships in a more multicolor world? A first step in this direction uh, is to explore the many polarizations that exist between monogamist and polyamorist. Both camps, in my experience, tend to enthrone the relational style as the most natural, healthiest, morally superior, and even spiritually evolved. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, you don't understand what true love is. 
monotel spoiling. What's happening to you is that you still haven't found true love for your soulmate. If you find them, you will see how you will become monogamous. Poly tells mono. What's happening to you is that you have not yet connected to the free, non-possessive, spiritual essence of love. <laughs> if you ever do that, you will see how you become at least more poly. <laughs> Second example, you are obsessed with sex. Mono tells poly. You talk about love without limits, but your poly desires emerge from sexual hedonism and greed, maybe even from sexual addiction. Confess that you are obsessed with sex. <laughs> poly tells mono. You judge polysexuality, but your elevation of sexual fidelity to a sacrosanct status shows that the one who is obsessed with sex is you. <laughs> Let go of that obsession, and you will be able to love with greater freedom. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> when presenting a way out of these monopoly wars, I have found helpful to refer to the contemporary transgender movement. Considered that less than a decade ago, and still today in many social contexts, one could only be male or female. But as many brave transgender people have demonstrated, we could now be both in between and beyond being male or being female. In the same way, overcoming the monopoly binary opens a rich tapestry of relational options that for a lack of a better word, I have called novogamy, novo nu gamia union. But how novogamy looks like in practice. Let me give you a few examples. As my personal story conveys, uh, developmental pools can lead people to choose monogamy or polyamory at different life stages. And there is no universal sequence here. Some people go from mono to poly, and others from poly to mono. And still others cycle through different monopoly cycles throughout the entire life. Second, different cultural contexts, such as geographical places, gatherings, and events can impact relational behaviors. For example, some married couples who are strictly monogamous at home give each other free passes when traveling, or attending festivals such as the Burning Man in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> Third, and very importantly, as the great American poet Walt Whitman famously wrote, very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And the image is pertinent here, because many people mentally or emotionally want monogamy while sexually desiring a diversity of lovers. Or, like a poly researcher I know, some people believe intellectually in polyamory, but they realize that they can only be sexual with one person. Consider also the impact of modern technology. Through his 3D avatar, my friend Juan has regular romantic encounters with women. Erotic conversations, dinners in exotic places, you name it, while in real life, He's monogamously married with his partner, Angela. And of course, it can be the other way around. You can be mono in the virtual world and poly in the physical or natural world. Finally, some people uh, feel that their existential identity has transcended the monopoly binary. And then they use new terms such as novogamy or ambiamory to describe the relational style. And still others, reject all labels which they perceive as limiting ideologies or conceptual boxes. So, are you mono or poly? <laughs> well, it can depend on when you ask the question, where are you when you do it, and what part of yourself are you asking, are you asking the question. And you can be both at the same time in different experiential settings or have transcended completely the need to define yourself through either of those categories. Importantly, in the same way that transracial identities are not better or worse than, say, African-American or Asian, being novogamous, of course, is no better or worse than being monogamous or polyamorous. But hey, and this is equally important, not anything goes. Qualitative distinctions can be made within and among relational styles. 
For example, it is, it is worth asking ourselves, is my relational style freely chosen by me? Was it freely chosen? Or was it rather adopted uh, by cultural default or social pressure? Is it my relational style attuned to my personal needs, my natural dispositions? There are some people who are many, very mono and others, you know, many, very poly. And uh, also something that is very important is that there are more and less honest, mindful, and mature ways to engage any relational style. So some forms of monogamy are better than certain forms of polyamory and vice versa. And finally, as ever, context matters. Polyamory, for example, could be re-traumatizing for someone with a history of sexual abuse, requiring a protected container to heal. But for a woman who has been for most of her life over controlled by a jealous patriarchal husband, polyamory could be tremendously liberating and healing. So yes, let's embrace diversity, but with discernment. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, you may say all oh, this is good food for thought, <laughs> but <laughs> what about sexual fidelity? Wouldn't that single factor cut the pie into mono and poly servings? Not so fast. Modern research shows that people's understandings of fidelity and infidelity are radically different. For some married couples, Conference or out-of-town sex doesn't count as cheating. But for others, pornography use, fantasizing about a third person, and even close opposite-sex friendships in the heterosexual people, that is, are considered blatant transgressions of the monogamous vow. To complicate things, not everybody agrees that sexual fidelity should be the qualifying standard for monogamy. For others, is Emotional fidelity, fidelity, a, a monogamy of the heart, as it has been called. And still for others, a spiritual fidelity or soul union. The takeaway here is that fidelity and infidelity are so differently demarcated that to make any clear cut generic distinction between monogamy and polyamory becomes virtually impossible. In closing, this talk emerges, obviously, from my own personal needs, uh, longings, and dreams. But in the dark ashes of so much relational confusion and suffering, I glimpse the birth of a finer love. But I cannot engender it alone. I need your help. Only together, we can co-create a world in which we can be fully ourselves, and we can be free to love. A world in which I, and perhaps you, and many others, can finally feel at home. As the great Sufi poet and mystic Rumi wrote, beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there, which in our present context, I take the license to reward as follows. Beyond monogamy and polyamory, there is an open field. I will meet you there. And since we are in Ibiza, I also hope that we also meet in the open dance floor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.